day, my wonderful students. <laughs> I wouldn't trade anything for being here with you today. I just love giving you the menopause education you deserve. And I know that you probably think you're the only ones benefiting from it, but you aren't. You should know that it's very rewarding for me too. It, it's like a trade. You receive the education, and I receive the reward for feeling like I've done something to improve your life. I'm always talking about trade-offs, and this is yet another trade-off. And when you think about it, all of life is about trade-offs. And that's precisely what we're going to discuss here today, trade-offs. But our particular focus will be on the trade-offs involved with screening mammograms. And it turns out that the trade-offs pertinent to screening, ma screening mammograms have become a great big debate. This is video number 395. It's part of our big unit on breast cancer, and this happens to be the 40th video in the unit. If you have my book, either the first edition or the second edition, it's a great idea to use it alongside these videos. They complement one another. And there are trade-offs between the two. <laughs> the book is more to the point, but these videos give you a bunch more information in a much more demonstrated style. So let's dive into the great debate. We began the topic of breast inspection with video number 390. And then I gave you individual videos on self-breast exam, clinical breast exam, and radiologic breast exam. You learned that mammograms are the gold standard for radiologic breast exam, and they constitute a screening test for breast cancer. The goal is to detect breast cancer early before you can feel it on self or clinical breast exam. In the last video, I presented all the different guidelines for mammograms that have been created by the various organizations involved in the management of breast cancer. And you discovered that these various sets of guidelines differ with regard to the age to start getting mammograms, the interval between mammograms, and the age to stop getting mammograms, if ever. Here's the chart of guidelines from last week's video. I'm not going to rehash this today. I just want to refresh your memory of how many differences there are in the various guidelines by various mammogram guideline makers. These differences are not only vast in terms of what they recommend, they are also extremely significant in terms of their different consequences. And that this is what has fueled the great debate. So what we have is a screening test for which there are differing guidelines. And the question for today is, why is there so much variation in these guidelines for this one screening test? Why in the world is there so much disagreement? Well, my dears, the reasons are many. Notice that I'm wearing somewhat of a debate t-shirt. Now, I was never on the debate team. Some people think I should have been. <laughs> but I've always seen debate teams as confrontational. And that's just not my style. Rather than arguing my case and bullying the other side, I tend to merely pose questions. It is never my intention to upset other people. But you know, sometimes when all you do is calmly ask questions, it still upsets others. <laughs> this is especially true when they are unable to answer those questions. I attended law school knowing full well that I would never actually practice law. I loved learning about all the debates, but certainly didn't want my life to be consumed by them. All that debating is just too mean and confrontational for me. But you definitely need to understand what fuels the debate 
over screening mammograms. So today, I'll present all the issues that contribute to this great debate on screening mammograms. It will help you arrive at your own decision as to what's best for you. As with any debate, there are pros and cons, benefits and risks, advantages and disadvantages that are at odds with one another. In other words, there are trade-offs. Unfortunately, with most debates, you rarely receive the whole truth or the whole story. Instead, most commonly, you hear this or that piece of each side, and you receive a lot of conflicting information, but you don't understand why. The fact is that when you hear the whole truth and the whole story, you are able to make sense of what used to seem like a confusing and conflicting situation. But it's really just part of the great debate. And, and most of the time, it enables you to understand why there's a debate in the first place. So I'll present all the issues that form any part of this great debate on screening mammograms. Of course, a chart is in order to parlay those great debate issues against one another. And the easiest thing to do is simply list the advantages and disadvantages of each debate issue. And what you'll see is that sometimes the advantages of one issue are the disadvantages of another. So let's jump into the debate and see what it's all about. The very first issue fueling the great debate on screening mammograms is the issue of your self-breast exam. You've learned that 70% of breast cancers are detected by radiologic breast exams, which means mammograms, while 30% are detected by women or their doctors on self-breast exam or clinical breast exam. I've taught you that your self-breast exam is vital because if you do it properly and regularly, you will be the world's greatest expert on your normal breasts and be able to find abnormalities very early. The problem is that most women resist performing their self-breast exam. The other problem is that the current guidelines recommend against women performing their own self-breast exams. So that leaves more responsibility to the mammograms, which then must compensate for what your self-breast exam could accomplish if you actually did it. But mammograms do not serve the same purpose as your self-breast exam. Your self-breast exam is for finding things that you can feel with your fingers before you can see them on a mammogram. And a mammogram is for finding things that you can see on the film before you can feel them with your fingers. So they serve two completely different purposes. And expecting a mammogram to do something it was never designed to do is unreasonable. So when it comes to the ability of a mammogram to compensate for an absent self-breast exam, it falls short. So let's chart that. Here you have the beginning of the chart we'll use to delineate all the factors contributing to the great debate. The first column is for the issue of debate. The second column in green for good is the advantages or capacities of mammograms. And the third column in red for rotten is for the disadvantages or incapacities of mammograms. In other words, the second column is for what mammograms can do, while the third column is for what mammograms cannot do. And I'm using red for rotten and green for good again. And you see that mammograms are incapable of performing the function of your self-breast exam. The next great debate issue on screening mammograms is the clinical breast exam by your doctor. You've learned that your doctor's ability to detect breast cancer early with an annual clinical breast exam pales in comparison to your ability to detect it early with your monthly self-breast exams. This is due 
to improper timing, improper technique, inadequate time, interruptions, distractions, and less familiarity with your breasts on the part of your doctor. So the clinical breast exam falls terribly short of its goals. But the ability of a mammogram to compensate for the shortcomings of clinical breast exam is yet another example of expecting a mammogram to do something it was never designed to do. So I'll put that on our chart. So mammograms are also incapable of performing the function of your doctor's clinical breast exam. Next is the big issue of when to get your first mammogram. Now, there are multiple trade-offs to consider for this one issue. The first trade-off for the guideline makers, that is, is cost. The earlier the starting age for mammograms, the higher the overall cost for screening mammograms for the entire population. And for any guideline makers focused on cost, there will be an incentive to defer the starting age of mammograms. Typically, the guideline contributors aiming to decrease cost are the insurance companies or the National Health Service. So the younger the starting age, the higher the cost. The older the starting age, the lower the cost. So this is a perfect example of a trade-off. And because it's a trade-off, I'm going to put a cost designation in each of our two columns for advantages and disadvantages of mammograms. The advantage of starting mammograms at an older age is lower cost. The disadvantage of starting mammograms at a younger age is higher cost. So here you see the first example of a situation in which it just depends on which side of the debate you sit. If you are an insurance company or National Health Service paying for mammograms, starting them at a later age will be an advantage. But if you are a patient wanting to start screening for breast cancer as early as possible, starting them at a later age is a disadvantage. This is what I meant when I said that the advantages of one can be the disadvantages of the other. But there is yet another trade-off with regard to cost. The trade-off for saving money is that you lose lives. So the younger the starting age, the more lives saved. The older the starting age, the more lives lost. Most women don't think this trade-off is worth the monetary considerations, but most insurance companies or National Health Service payers do. This is why I tell you to do what gives you peace of mind personally. And don't worry about what the guidelines dictate for the entire population of women. So the advantage of starting mammograms at a younger age is that we save more lives. The disadvantage of starting mammograms at an older age is that we lose more lives. And there's yet another trade-off related to the starting age for mammograms. Breast density. Generally speaking, the younger the starting age, the higher the breast density. And the older the starting age, the lower the breast density. This is important because dense breasts make it difficult to read a mammogram. I discussed this in great detail in video number 393 on radiologic breast exam. And if you can't read the mammogram, it cannot serve the purpose of revealing breast cancer early. So the younger the starting age, the denser the breasts, and the less useful the mammogram. While the older the starting age, the fattier the breasts, and the more useful the mammogram. So these trade-offs of dense or fatty breasts belong in the cells pertaining to starting age that we created previously. The advantage of starting mammograms at an older age is that the breasts are fattier and the mammogram is easier to read. 
The disadvantage of starting mammograms at a younger age is that the breasts are denser and the mammogram is more difficult to read. And now we come to the next issue, which is a biggie. I think this is the most significant part of the great debate about screening mammograms. It's the issue of false positives. Another way of saying this is that it's when the mammogram lies. Mammograms are screening tests, and all screening tests are required to err on the side of suspecting a problem when there is none, rather than missing a problem when there is one. So this is an absolute requirement for mammograms to be considered screening tests in the first place. But when mammograms function in precisely this manner, it creates a debate. Instead of saying, oh well, that's what screening tests are supposed to do. Both women and doctors fault mammograms for not being perfect. Women complain that false alarms cause fear and anxiety that are unwarranted when it's just a false alarm. Doctors and guideline makers claim that the false positives cause harm in terms of necessitating additional procedures. It's really kind of goofy when you stop and think about it. In order for mammograms to be a screening test, they have to have some false positives. But when they have false positives, they are accused of causing harm. Well, folks, you can't have it both ways. Either you accept erring on the side of suspecting a problem when there is none, or you sacrifice missing a problem when there is one. The way to think about this is to think about how many women will die if mammograms have to be perfect before they can be used as a screening test. And the bottom line is that if the mammogram cannot lie, more women will die. And that's because if a mammogram could never lie, the mammogram would never mislabel a normal mammogram as abnormal. The only abnormal mammograms would be in women who definitely have breast cancer. But there would be others that were missed. So it's a matter of more lies means fewer die. This is in keeping with the story of the boy who cried wolf. And it's actually very interesting <laughs> that he cried wolf because the man who created the first system for categorizing breasts by density was Dr. Wolf with an E on the end. <laughs> the key is to understand that mammograms have to be able to cry wolf in order to be screening tests that they are designed to be. If crying wolf is harmful, then you have to decide if it's worth the so-called harm. So the advantage of false positives is that they avoid missing cancers. And the disadvantage of false positives is that they cause anxiety and harm. For our next issue, we have the interval between mammograms. This refers to whether you have a mammogram every year or every two years or every three years, etc. The very goal of mammograms as a screening test is to detect breast cancer as early as possible. So the more frequently you get a mammogram, the more readily it will detect breast cancer as early as possible. And the less frequently you get a mammogram, the less readily it will detect breast cancer as early as possible. But the trade-offs come in the form of false positives. The more frequently you get mammograms, the more false positives you will incur. And the less frequently you get mammograms, the fewer false positives you will incur. So finding breast cancer early comes with more false positives. Another way to look at this is to consider whether 
A larger tumor found on a subsequent mammogram is a success of the subsequent mammogram or a failure of the previous mammogram. Do you see how the advantages of one are the disadvantages of the other? This is very commonly the case with trade-offs. So we'll add two new rows to our chart. One for a short interval between mammograms and the other for a long interval between mammograms. And we'll designate the trade-offs. So for a short interval between mammograms, the advantage is earlier diagnosis and the disadvantage is more false positives. But for a long interval between mammograms, the advantage is fewer false positives and the disadvantage is later diagnosis. Along these same lines, you have the issues of overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. Overdiagnosis is when a mammogram diagnoses something that never would have caused symptoms or death during your lifetime. I talked about this in the context of carcinoma in situ of the breast. Carcinoma in situ is merely some individual neoplastic cells that have not behaved as a cancer, and they may never behave as a cancer. But because there is no way to know at the time of diagnosis whether it will stay put and do nothing versus transform into an invasive breast cancer, diagnosing it on a mammogram can lead to excessive treatment. The rampant fear of breast cancer has created a lot of overdiagnosis. Underdiagnosis is when there is failure to detect a cancer. This is not common with mammograms for breast cancer. The fear of breast cancer has heightened awareness and overdiagnosis to such an extent that women who have only had breast precancer are treated as if they had the full-blown disease. So overdiagnosis is an issue, while underdiagnosis is not. Let's put this on our chart. So the advantage of overdiagnosis is early diagnosis, and the disadvantage of overdiagnosis is excessive treatment. Our next issue pertains to the frequency of mammograms with increasing age. You've learned that breast cancer incidence increases with age, and yet some breast cancer guidelines recommend fewer or no mammograms at advanced ages. Does that make any sense to you? Why would you perform fewer or no mammograms in women who are at the highest risk of breast cancer? to save money, that's why. Guidelines that recommend fewer or no mammograms with advancing age are saying, why spend money on mammograms for older women when older women are likely to die of something else soon anyway? It's insensitive, but nobody ever intended for guidelines to be kind. They are merely the standard for very basic medical care. So if you decrease the frequency of mammograms at any age, more breast cancers will go undetected and more women will die of breast cancer. And if you stop getting mammograms at any age rather than continuing them for the rest of your life, more breast cancers will go undetected and more women will die of breast cancer. Time to chart that. So the advantage of fewer mammograms with age is that it saves money. And the disadvantage of fewer mammograms with age is that it leaves breast cancer undetected. The advantage of stopping mammograms at a designated age is that it saves money. But the disadvantage of stopping mammograms at a designated age is that it leaves breast cancer undetected and increases deaths for breast cancer.
So these are all issues at the root of the great debate in screening mammogram circles. So are mammograms more beneficial or more harmful? If you read all the medical literature like I do, you encounter study after study, article after article, opinion after opinion, and commentary after commentary debating these issues. Here's a great big pile <laughs> of all the literature I read on just this screening mammogram debate. These are all commentaries, editorials, studies, you name it. As I've told you before, I do a lot of planning for your education. This is why I'm always at least two years ahead in creating these videos for you. I take the time to read, highlight, cross-correlate all the information so that I can deliver it to you in a format that gives you the whole story but also puts it into perspective. So now you understand why I'm not wearing a t-shirt that simply says debate team on it. This t-shirt says, <laughs> if I say, first of all, run away because I have prepared charts, data, and research, and I will destroy you. <laughs> That's how I engage in a debate. The difference is that I merely pose questions. And although I never ever seek to destroy anybody, <laughs> That's how the inability to answer the questions can make some people feel. <laughs> I try to present the issues behind the screening mammogram great debate in a way that helps you understand that there are trade-offs with all of them. The ultimate decisions are all yours. The key is to see both sides and always do what gives you the most peace of mind. The chart is your summary, and you can find it via the link in the description box just under the screen, or you can go to menopausetaylor.me where you'll find all my charts and can get whole packages of them. As I was preparing this video, I kept thinking back to the year 2010 when I moved to Nice, France. At the time, I had never lived in France before, and I didn't speak any French at all when I first arrived, so I did what I always do, enroll in school, <laughs> French school that is. <laughs> I enrolled in a French language school that is designed for foreigners. And typically, foreigners come to such a school and study French for a couple of weeks or maybe a month. Well, I enrolled for an entire year. <laughs> the school had never had a student enroll for a full year. <laughs> so they knew I was odd from the start. <laughs> they had two different varieties of French immersion classes. Complete immersion, in which you attended school for eight hours a day, and semi-immersion, in which you attended school for four hours a day. And I did something very unlike my usual self and chose the semi-immersion. <laughs> Normally I go for the hardest, the best, the most. I'm a complete nerd, I love school. But I decided that because I was gonna live in France for a year, I could forfeit the extra four hours a day. So I went to French school for four hours a day, every day for an entire year. And at the end of the year, I spoke and read, read and understood and wrote intermediate level French. In any case, I wrote articles throughout my year in France and everywhere else I've lived. And one of them was entitled, The Great Debate. It's just a fun read about a great debate we had in French school one day. <laughs> and I've posted it on my website in the event that you want to read it. From time to time, I post a fun article from my many years of living in foreign countries. I've lived on every continent except Antarctica. And believe me, when you live in different countries, you learn a lot about a lot of things. And you end up with lots of great debates and lots of great writing material. <laughs> <laughs> so read it if you'd like. <laughs> this is where I'll stop today. Um, one thing about which there is no debate whatsoever is whether or not you should schedule a consultation with me at menopausetaylor.me. You definitely should. No matter how much you think you know, 
And no matter how much you get out of these videos, you should schedule a consultation. No video can tailor everything to the one and only you. So regardless of where you are in your pre, peri, or postmenopausal journey, a consultation will improve the entire rest of your life. Be sure to come back next week for a presentation on the alternatives to mammograms. In the meantime, find me on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Stories. And subscribe here before you leave today. Bye-bye, <laughs> my dears. <laughs>